All right, uh, before I begin, I'd like to acknowledge my co-authors, uh, April Latham, the moderator of our session, and uh, David Bjornberg. So, um, does anyone here think they know what a bioaerosol is? Maybe, it's pretty easy to figure out. Don't raise your hand, Matt, because I might call on you. So, this, this, kinda, this picture kind of says it all. Humans are bioaerosol generating machines, okay? And if you're unfortunate, you might experience some bioaerosols today when the guy behind you sneezes on you. So what are bioaerosols? Um, bioaerosols are basically suspended or airborne biological particles. They can consist of viable and non-viable particles and their um, fragments and byproducts. So for example, um, if a bacteria or virus is suspended in the air, well then that's a bioaerosol. Okay, and it can consist of a mixture of droplets um, and dry particles. And their aerodynamic diameters um, generally range from 0.5 to 100 micrometers. So what are the health concerns associated with bioaerosols? Uh, bioaerosols less than uh, 5 micrometers are probably um, of largest risk because they're transported deep into the lungs. Um, in agricultural settings, um, the, it's the microbial component of dust that contributes um, to pulmonary disease. So allergenic, toxic, and inflammatory responses are caused not only by viable um, organisms or viable biological particles, but can also be caused by non-viable microorganisms and their fragments and byproducts. So we know that bioaerosols can be transported great distances. In 1981, foot and mouth disease was known to be transported um, from Brittany in France, the Brittany region, uh, across the English Channel to the Isle of Wight. And that's a distance of over 200 kilometers. Um, so today we're going to talk specifically about dairies. So why are dairies a potential source of bioaerosols? Well, you have lots of cows, you have large quantities of manure, and each cow is producing approximately 55 kilograms of wet manure per day. So you just have this huge increase in the microbial load within the production environment. To make matters worse, you also, within the feces, you sometimes have zoonotic pathogens. And the bioaerosols in, these envir in the environment here can be a potential health risk to livestock, to farm workers, and to individuals downwind. So how do bioaerosols form? Okay, um, pretty obvious to most people that work uh, in cattle production or in dairies and livestock and so forth. Uh, animal movement's a big one. Um, the cattle shuffling around the lots, there's manure on the lots, they're kicking up dust particles. The dust particles have bacteria, virus, and so forth on them. Um, feed preparation. There's a lot of bacteria on uh, plant material. So you're mixing up the, the feed, generating more dust. Um, land application of manure. It's an obvious one. And as you're turning compost. Now, once the, air, the, the biological particles are suspended in the air, they're subjected to meteorological factors like temperature, uh, solar radiation, and humidity. So in general, the viability of the biological particles will um, decrease with increases in solar radiation and temperature. And that makes sense because you have a particle in the air, and I'll talk about that on the next slide. They're very susceptible to these factors. And if you have a decrease in relative humidity, um, you tend to have a decrease in their viability. So basically, um, if you have an airborne, basically one airborne bacteria, bacterium, I should say, um, they're very susceptible to these meteorological factors. If they're clumped, um, they're going to be a little less susceptible, especially the microorganisms in the center of the clump. Um, and the biological particles can also be associated with dust particles and so forth. And so if they're on the outside of the dust particle, they're partially protected. And they can also be um, embedded in the middle of a, a, a solid particle. And they're really, really protected from uh, UV uh, temperature and moisture fluctuations. 
So um, this is a picture of the 10,000 cow open free stall dairy that um, April pointed out earlier. Usually while we're doing um, gas emission work, we're also doing bioaerosol work at, at the same location. Um, so during the course of the year, in the spring, summer, and fall, we collected samples in the morning, afternoon, and night. Um, this basically is the downwind sample locations. The wind is typically from the west. Um, and so we have an upwind site, 200 meters upwind, and we have a, a downwind sites 50 and 200 meters. Um, and if the wind was coming from the east, then we just swap our locations. And I put this little star out here because um, I also set some samplers out there while they were um, spray irrigating with dairy wastewater. And I should point out that we quantified uh, heterotrophic bacteria, total coliforms, E. coli, coliphage, fungi, and endotoxin. And I'll talk a little bit more about endotoxin um, in the, later on in the presentation. And um, I also extracted bacterial DNA and created the clone library so I could identify what was um, airborne. Uh, quickly, just some of the techniques we used to capture bioaerosols. We used some glass impingers, uh, wetted wall cyclone, uh, filter samplers. This is like an open face filter uh, for capturing airborne endotoxin and impact sampler single stage for fungi. So what I've done is I've summarized the results. I'm not going to show you every single day. This is the general trend. So you have upwind, this is airborne bacteria, uh, upwind location, the down, two downwind locations. And this is basically, so you have a pretty low back, up, background or upwind concentration. Immediately downwind, you have a huge spike. So you go from a few thousand uh, colony forming units of bacteria to 80,000 colony forming units of bacteria per cubic meter of air. And then as you increase your distance away from the dairy operation, you have a huge drop. Um, I just wanted to point out that I generally did not detect uh, fecal uh, indicators. It's probably a sampling method issue and we can talk about this a little bit later if you'd like to. So here's uh, diurnal effects on airborne bacteria. Pretty much uh, at the downwind location, you'll see a very distinct spike at nighttime. And why is this occurring? Well, you tend to have more stable atmospheric conditions. The cattle are shuffling around, um, and therefore you just generally, and lower wind speed, so you have a much higher bacterial load in the air. Flying through this. Um, okay, so here are the results from the airborne filamentous fungi uh, upwind. What we found was that the upwind concentration on average throughout the whole sampling period um, was higher than what you'd see downwind. So it's almost like the dairies are a sink. I'm not sure what's going on there. It seems very unusual. But th this result at the open free stall dairy is somewhat similar to what we saw at um, an open lot dairy. Diurnal effects, there really weren't many uh, to speak of. Um, overall, there, were no, there was no statistical difference um, at any of the locations. So I mentioned uh, airborne endotoxin. Um, April and I have uh, done a lot of work on this particular topic. So what is endotoxin? Endotoxin is the lipopolysaccharide from gram-negative bacteria. It's from the outer membrane of gram-negative bacteria. Um, they're ubiquitous in the environment. I'm sure I could measure them right here in this room. Um, inhalation is the main route of exposure to endotoxin. At fairly low concentrations, um, you can, ha uh, as far as acute exposures go, you can develop cough, airway irritation, um, and pulmonary dysfunction, uh, lung dysfunction. Um, at high exposure levels, so you can develop influenza-like symptoms. And those that work in the cotton industry develop bisonosis, which is a chronic cough, and that's um, associated with exposure to endotoxin um, in that environment. Now, what's very interesting, though, is that some studies suggest a lower risk uh, for asthma and lung cancer, especially those that work in the dairy industry. So this is the concentration of inhalable endotoxin. So that's endotoxin associated with particles less than 100 micrometers in diameter. And once again, the same trend. You have a fairly low background, background concentration. You have a spike. 
um, two levels that have, you know, are reported to cause lung dysfunction and flu-like symptoms and so forth. And then you have a decrease and slowly approaching background concentrations near 200 meters away from the facility. Diurnal effects uh, downwind, uh, most pronounced uh, at night as you hit the afternoon and night, uh, you have much higher concentrations in the air, as I explained before with the bacteria. Now we set up some experiments. We were immediately downwind of the open lot dairy, um, open, the freestall dairy, and um, we collected samples over an eight hour period. And the blue line is background, the red line is downwind. And um, you can see here, you know, things are going along and you have this huge spike to 5,000 endotoxin units per cubic meter of air. And that was during a lot harrowing event. So just like, you know, when the cattle kick up dust, if you go through the lots and harrow, you're gonna kick up dust also. Um, wind is another important factor. Um, to increasing the airborne endotoxin concentration. Um, in this case, the wind went from about two, I should say four to 10 uh, miles per hour, and you have a steady increase also in the endotoxin concentration. Uh, over here, you see several spikes on the, on the lower right here, and basically the cows were coming in and out of the freestall barns, and once again, they were kicking up dust. So using the data on the previous slide, I um, calculated some emission factors, and then I put this into an area source model, a dispersion model, and um, calculated the downwind uh, concentration. And generally what we see is from about, uh, when you're at about 500 to 2,000, then you start 2,000 meters away from the dairy, you start dropping to background concentrations. And the data um, from that model um, actually matches very well with the empirical endotoxin data that I collected at um, another dairy that's an open lot dairy. So you get that, that trend where things drop off with distance from the facility. So just to put things in perspective, um, with other agricultural environments, I took the maximum concentration that we saw at the uh, freestall dairy, and uh, that's around 4,000 endotoxin units. And, and just comparing it, say, to grain harvest, where you hit about 6,000 endotoxin units, uh, a pig farm, you're really getting up there around 7,000. So, you know, dairy, uh, this particular dairy falls kind of at the high end of what you'd see in other ag environments. Um, but, um, you know, it, it, it's, you know, it's in the ballpark. So here are Pearson correlation coefficients uh, between bioaerosol concentration and meteorological factors. And you'll see a positive, let's just look here at air temperature. You definitely see a positive correlation between air temperature um, and the bacteria and fungi concentration. Um, it would also make sense that you have a positive correlation with endotoxin. Um, because if your bacterial concentration is going up, you'd expect your endotoxin concentration to go up. Um, some interesting results here, but yes, uh, with respect to solar radiation, um, you expect as the solar intensity increases, you would uh, have a decrease uh, in the concentration of these bioaerosols. Um, and wind speed too, um, we did see an increase in the bacteria concentration uh, with wind speed, but fungi, on the other hand, as the wind speed went up, the fungi concentration went down. I'm not quite sure what's going on there, but that's the result. So as I mentioned, um, I created a clone library of the 16S ribosomal RNA and um, sequenced, and according to sequence identification, the bacteria fit into um, these uh, four phyla, and this is the background here. So we have the number of clones, and then we have the percentage of the total. And, and here are the results, the dairy barn and lots, downwind of the dairy barns and lots, and then pivot spraying dairy wastewater. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about that near the end of my presentation. Um, 
pretty much uh, we identified a lot more unique clones downwind of the dairies and downwind of the pivot spring dairy wastewater. Um, the percentage, though, of the total compared to the background is very similar. Um, and we identified some more actinobacteria, not many, um, and some unclassified clones downwind of those facilities. Um, the, here is a list of the uh, common bacterial genera in the dairy aerosol samples, and this would just be inclusive of both uh, downwind of the lots and, and the barns and downwind of the pivot irrigation systems. And I don't know if you can really tell, but um, I have some highlighted in red. And the ones highlighted in red, Clostridium, Methylobacterium, Pseudomonas, Ralstonia, Rhizobium, Sphingomonas, those are the ones that were detected upwind. And then everything else in black and in red was detected downwind. So we definitely, in, in the air, you can see an increase in the uh, diversity of the gen genera and uh, just number of different sequences. So what was interesting, though, here was that uh, downwind of the facility that only 3% of the sequences were similar um, with bacteria from cow milk, uh, the rumen, and fecal samples. So you'd expect more, but that's just what I saw. Um, and I guess on the positive note is that none of the sequences that um, I investigated or analyzed were affiliated with bacteria known to be pathogenic to otherwise healthy uh, humans. So um, I want to talk a little bit about the spray irrigation of dairy wastewater because this is another way that pathogens can become aerosolized um, and then are a potential threat to uh, downwind receptors. And in Idaho and many other western states, um, the dairy wastewaters are commonly spray irrigated um, onto the land. And it's a good way to transfer nutrients to the soil. It's also a good way just to get rid of your wastewater. So um, they pump out a lot of the lagoons, as April mentioned, um, in the fall to prepare the lagoon to handle all the wastewater that's going to come during the winter. And then in the spring, once again, they'll pump them out. Um, so here is a conceptual model of human infection from land, the land application of wastewater. Um, so there's your wastewater. Um, it's pumped through the pivot. And um, what can happen here is you can have form small droplets, uh, which basically are aerosols. The aerosols can then become dispersed, and someone downwind may inhale them, and then there's a potential risk of infection. Um, Conversely, some of the particles will eventually deposit. They could land on produce or fomites and then become ingested. And, and then once again, there's a potential risk of infection. Um, large droplets greater than 150 micrometers uh, typically drop out pretty quickly. And uh, they can land on other surfaces where they could be ingested. So what we've been doing so far is kind of picking our way through this whole process to get as much information uh, to find, to get an answer down here. Um, it's basically part of a quantitative microbial risk assessment that uh, we're conducting. And so I have a little bit of information that I'll show you. So with respect to the dairy pond, I mean, the most obvious thing you want to do is determine what's in the pond. So um, I um, use real-time PCR to quantify these pathogens up here, bacterial pathogens and uh, protozoa. Um, and you probably can't tell, but some of them are in red. So what we quantified, or what we detected, were Campylobacter, uh, Salmonella, Clostridium, um, Listeria, um, E. coli, uh, O157H7, and Mycobacterium avium, which um, could be a potential cause of Crohn's disease in humans, but causes yonis in cattle. And uh, I, I know you can't read this, but this is here for my own purpose. Um, we detected them. We collected samples in June, August, and October. We detected these pathogens um, pretty much in all months. And the concentrations generally range from 10 to the second, 10 to the two, to 10 to the fourth um, uh, cells per milliliter of wastewater. So we know what's in the ponds now, and we know what concentration they are in the ponds. Um, the other factor that um, I'm investigating, and these results were published in ASABE, 
um, is the impact of the, the sprinkler and pressure on the microorganisms. So when they're being released, you know, they're coming out at high pressure and then they're smacking a plate. So I wanted to see what happened there. And this was just a little setup that we had at the dairy, um, a drum. We put different sprinkler heads in here, um, basically a flat plate or a rotator. Um, we tested 20, 30, and 40 PSI pressure. And we would uh, pump the dairy wastewater through here, and we'd collect the sample before and after. And pretty much what we saw, there was, that there was really no effect of pressure um, and a spray plate on the viability of the microorganisms. And we, used, we looked at a number of indicators, like E. coli, coliphage, uh, maybe clostridium, and a few others. And I could forward those results to you if you're interested. Um, another thing, another part of the equation, the uh, conceptual model, is assessing the amount of organisms that are ultimately aerosolized. So uh, we have a, uh, a spray irrigation boom, so we're simulating a center pivot. It's 50 meters long, um, and we're using bromide ions as a conservative tracer. I'm not messing with microorganisms because there's a whole bunch of other issues when you're spraying live microorganisms, and it's quite messy when you're dealing with wastewater and just trying to spray wastewater. So it's, it's a much easier approach, cleaner approach, um, to dealing, to um, evaluating these scenarios. So we set up, um, and I have it in the other slide, we set up towers here. So we have some of our um, uh, impingers on those towers immediately downwind from the irrigation boom. And um, here are the impingers, and we send them all the way up to about 40 feet. And we also, so those are to capture the, bio, the aerosols. We have little pads to capture drift. Those would be particles bigger than bioaerosols that would kind of drift off, but eventually they're going to settle. And um, to complete the mass balance of the bromide, we have surface and subsurface catch cans. And uh, just summarize the results, what do we find? Um, I have a lot more results than this, but um, this is what I was able to gather at the moment. Um, this is, so everything, this is just basically a mass balance of everything, of the bromide. Um, and pretty much what we found is that around 2.3% of maximum, 2.3% during these studies of the water, or the bromide, I should say, was aerosolized. So what does that really mean? So that means during an irrigation scenario, when you're pumping wastewater, that probably around a few percent of the bacteria will actually become aerosolized. And this is just um, showing the relationship between wind speed and the percent of water aerosolized here on the left and the percent of water as drift. So um, as your wind speed increases, you have more aerosol generation. As your wind speed increases, you have more drift. Um, so from a BMP standpoint, you would think if bioaerosols from center pivots is an issue, you probably wouldn't want to irrigate on windy days. So to summarize, and keeping us on track here, dairies are certainly a source of elevated bioaerosol concentrations. But the, the bioaerosol concentrations decrease with distance from the facility because of dispersion. Um, the level of bioaerosol um, did not follow a seasonal trend. And I, I should have pointed that out a little bit earlier, which was kind of interesting. But it did correlate, they did correlate with some meteorological factors. Um, as I discussed, pathogens were not detected in the aerosol samples, but that doesn't mean that they're not there. I mean, we were only out there, you know, a few days a month. We're not out there 24 hours a day, so it is possible that they are present. Um, but considering the uh, information that we generated in the study and the fact that bioaerosol concentrations decrease with distance from, from the facility, um, one would expect the risk of bioaerosol exposure to be minimal at extended downwind distances. So um, that's all I have to say. Thank you, and I'll take any questions. You know, that's a good question. And um, I've read all the literature, and it 
there really isn't much out there saying there are pathogens in bioaerosols. But as you well, you know, as you very well know, this could be some of you know a sampling deficiency and analysis problem. Yeah, detection limits. In the aerosol samples, you know, well, what I did was, as I mentioned, I set up samplers downwind. I didn't use, like, specific probe and primer sets in those samples, no. So I didn't do that, but I used some universal primers, and that could explain some of the results that I saw.